Hi everyone, my name is Mark Wexmonski. I'm the Geriatric Nurse Clinician with the Arlington Council on Aging. Welcome again to another episode of Living Out Loud. Uh, I'm without Susan Karp today, uh, but wanted to briefly talk with you all about um, a significant issue amongst the senior population, and that's older adults and depression. Uh, so depression, oftentimes we think of it as the winter blues or feeling down or feeling sad, and I'll elaborate uh, that in a second, but depression can come to a point in someone's life where uh, medical uh, or psychiatric treatment uh, is necessary. So it's a true and treatable medical condition and extends beyond the normal parts of aging, and I'll explain a little bit that, about that in a second. Uh, it's considered a, a mood disorder with constant feelings of sadness and loss of interest in life or things that uh, one uh, had once enjoyed and a couple other things which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, seniors are at increased risk uh, for a whole bunch of co-founding factors and risk factors, which again I'll talk about uh, in, the, in the future slides. And this is more than just the blues. So sometimes if we have a loss of life, a loss of friendship, a loss of something that was significant to our life and we're feeling sad as a result, that's often called situational depression uh, where you're feeling sad, depressed because of the situation, uh, the loss of something that um, you had once previously enjoyed or and or had. And so depression amongst the senior population, uh, statistics vary. Uh, some estimates say that one to 5% of seniors uh, are depressed when they're living with the, in, inside the community, whatever community that is. 13.5%, um, um, the estimates show that seniors are depressed when they require home care services. So these are things like visiting nurse services, physical therapy services, occupational therapy, uh, and all the addis additional resources available um, to help seniors age in place. Um, that's kind of a double-edged sword because sometimes these services, these home care services are actually a good thing and folks actually feel more supportive um, when those are in place and can counteract uh, some, sometimes depression. Um, and statistics vary about uh, when seniors are hospitalized in terms of if they're feeling depressed and that statistics is 11.5%. Uh, and hospitalization includes acute care facilities, long-term care facilities such as nursing homes uh, and other skilled uh, nursing centers. <clears throat> so what are the signs and symptoms of depression? Some say that uh, depression can be weeks, um, can last for weeks or sometimes even longer. Sometimes folks can go many, many years uh, being chronically depressed. Uh, and the onset can vary depending, someone can be depressed from their entire youth all the way up through the lifespan or uh, are, are more depressed as uh, they get into um, their senior years. So again, some of those signs and symptoms, they may include uh, hopelessness and pessimism, so that constant negativity about the world and their life, uh, worthlessness or helplessness, um, sometimes feeling, ha sometimes folks have an inadequate self-worth, uh, poor self-esteem, um, that can lead to, to depression and helplessness. So problems present themselves and folks lack that self-esteem, uh, that self-work to uh, figure out a way to address uh, those issues and, and essentially help themselves. Another sign and symptom, which is kind of sometimes counteractive to what we often think about uh, during depression is irritability and restlessness. Sometimes it's called uh, an agitation depression. Uh, folks who are depressed oftentimes have a loss of interest in activities. So if we go down to the senior center frequently, uh, if we're engaging with friends in the community, if we're exercising, if we really like those activities, and over a period of time we notice ourselves having a loss of interest in those activities, uh, that can be a significant sign of, of depression. Difficulty concentrating, insomnia, so inability to fall asleep at night. Uh, sleep hygiene is actually a critical, uh, a critical thing to uh, prevent depression. Uh, in addition, hypersomnia, which is too much sleep, can also be a sign of, of depression. Uh, overeating or appetite loss, just really having little motivation to eat, or sometimes folks, when they're feeling sad and depressed, will um, try to remediate that, that depressive feeling by overindulging in, in too much food. Sometimes folks, when it gets to a critical level of depression, they may have thoughts of, of self-harm. Um, and then sometimes there can be somatic complaints consistent with depression, such as persistent aches or pains that can kind of be vague in, ori in origin, uh, might be new onset. You may correlate feeling sad to an increased uh, feeling of, of pain and aches, uh, headaches, other cramps, uh, gastrointestinal problems, 
Um, sometimes it can be constipation and or diarrhea. Um, and sometimes these, uh, these vague symptoms, um, they continue on despite going to the doctor and going tests and trying to figure out what they are. Um, so you can have these symptoms and be treated, but still have them um, because of the, the underlying depression. Uh, and kind of a newer thing uh, that shows that you, someone might be depressed are hoarding behaviors. So oftentimes when folks are, are collecting too much, um, the theory of thought is that they're trying to collect so much, uh, so much material in their life to, to cope for a loss that they once had. Um, and to, you know, it's, it's kind of a subtle sign of depression, but uh, new research shows that, again, hoarding, be hoarding behaviors is one of those signs and symptoms. So earlier I talked about uh, why seniors may be at increased risk for depression. Uh, one is that as we age, and sometimes we uh, are more prone to other health issues, um, which can be a loss of mobility and other uh, activities of daily living, to different uh, level of functioning. So illness disability is a risk factor. Uh, chronic and severe untreated pain is another risk factor for depression uh, and certainly cognitive decline. So sometimes folks uh, are concerned about their capacity to remember things uh, and notice that loss and compared to previous years and that may, may, may start them, may make them start feeling you know, kind of sad and depressed that um, going through the aging process can be a, a difficult time. Another risk factor is loneliness and, and isolation. So living alone, uh, a shrinking social circle, family members who have passed, friends who have passed, other important figures in our life who have passed, uh, when those folks um, depart, you know, we're kind of, we, we just feel isolated. We have that kind of lack of connection um, that we once previously had. Uh, another risk factor is a reduced sense of purpose, so a loss of identity. Uh, there's some research shows that sometimes as folks retire and they get into to older years, uh, they lack uh, a specific purpose in their life, which can be a spiritual thing um, that would need remediation. Fears, so fear of deathing, uh, fear of deathing, fear of death and dying, uh, and anxieties as well is another risk factor. And recent bereavements, which we talked about before, uh, sometimes can be perceived as situational depression. Depression, um, but if the bereavement uh, and the the coping uh, is difficult over six, eight months to a year, that may move yourself into the category of, of feeling depressed or being clinically diagnosed as depressed. So uh, what are the, how is someone diagnosed as being depressed? And it's according to what's called the DSM-5. DSM stands for Diagnostic, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's what all prescribers, psychiatrists, psychi psychologists use as a tool uh, as a guideline to diagnose someone with depression and other mood, thought, and cognitive disorders. Uh, so if you have some of those symptoms we talked about earlier, they would compare what your symptoms are into the DSM-5 and make a, a clinical diagnosis. So um, the presence of at least five of uh, the criteria I talked about before, insomnia, lack of interest, um, somatic complaints, um, those type things and, and the other ones that I mentioned before. Uh, so if you have at least five of those criteria occurring daily uh, during the same two week period, or um, that can be a clinical diagnosis of depression uh, in addition to different geriatric depression scales that exist as tools for uh, clinicians to use to, to make diagnosis. Uh, so again, official diagnosis is, is done by uh, a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist uh, versus a friend who says, you know, you're depressed, you're this, you're that. Um, granted, those friends might be have uh, noticed things that are concerning um, and hopefully they're steering you to those who can make a diagnosis. So um, I mentioned before about a, a geriatric depression scale. Again, this is a tool used by clinicians to, to make a diagnosis and oftentimes it's, it's basic yes or no questions. Uh, so I have a tool here and some of the questions you might be asked if you're being assessed for depression. Are you basically satisfied with your life? Yes or no? Have you dropped many of your activities or interests? Yes or no? Do you feel like your life is empty? Again, yes or no? Do you often get bored? Are you hopeful about the future? Do you perseverate or have bothersome thoughts frequently that you can't turn off, quote unquote? Are you afraid something bad is going to happen to you? Do you feel happy most of the time? Yes or no? 
Do you often feel helpless? Yes or no? Do you often feel restless or fidgety? Yes or no? Do you often feel like crying? Yes or no? Um, so again, this tool answering yes or no to those questions can help that clinician make it uh, an official diagnosis. Um, and sometimes we hear in the media and from other clinicians and friends as well that you know this person has dementia or this person has depression and sometimes those terms are used uh, interchangeably uh, but there's actually a difference between those, t those terms which is something important to know. So the differences between dementia and depression, uh, the onset is quite different. So with dementia, um, de again dementia is a cognitive disorder uh, with short-term memory impairment. Uh, versus depression is a mood disorder, so it affects your, your mood. So dementia, uh, it, the onset is slow, it's an indeterminate. Depression is rapid with, with mood changes. Length of symptoms, dementia, it's usually long. And depression, it's, it's usually short, but can extend um, beyond. Dementia, the orientation of someone, uh, so they have impaired an orientation to themselves, others, and their, uh, their general way of life versus uh, depression, um, their orientation is intact, but again, their behavior is, is the difference. Uh, dementia, the neurologic deficits is often present uh, versus depression, neurologic depression, uh, deficits are, are, are absent. So you'll still have um, a pretty good neurologic capacity uh, with depression versus dementia, whereas, whereas you wouldn't. Um, dementia, the, the disability is oftentimes concealed by a person, so they'll figure out ways to conceal the dementia, uh, whether that's a conscious or unconscious um, concealment is up for a clinician to decide. Uh, and versus depression, the disability is oftentimes highlighted in the person and the symptoms that they're presenting. Dementia, uh, with their memory impairments, they're actually com usually completely unaware of the loss of, of their memory. Uh, versus depression, they'll complain about memory, memory loss. So that means they're having a conscious thought that their memory is impaired. Uh, with dementia, there's oftentimes no psychiatric uh, history of any other um, mood, cognitive, or thought disorders, although some research say that might be changing. Versus depression, oftentimes there is a lifelong history of, uh, of depression at certain periods within a person's life. Uh, so how is depression treated? Oftentimes it's with medic medications and there's a whole host of different class of medications. Uh, SSRIs, uh, which is a, a term for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, these can help with generalized anxiety, depression, major depression. These are medications like Celexa, Lexapro, uh, Paxil, um, Prozac, and a whole host of others. There's another medication class called tricyclics, which are actually rarely used now because of uh, certain contraindications, but they still exist. Uh, another medication class is called uh, MAOIs, again, rarely used because of significant contraindications, especially among the senior populations. Uh, there's another class of medications called SNRIs, which is selective uh, neuroepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Uh, which kind of work in the same class as SSRIs. The only difference is they're more uh, activating on the system. So if someone is, uh, has vegetative depression symptoms, such as lack of appetite, uh, staying in bed, poor energy, uh, SNRIs are more likely to be used because of their more stimulating effect. Uh, those medications include Welbutrin and Effexor and a couple others. And there's another, uh, a cover, another class called benzodiazepines. Um, this medication is uh, oftentimes uh, confused with uh, a, a few others um, and can be um, a source of abuse if, if misused. Uh, these medications are oftentimes related to more acute anxiety episodes. Um, so Ativan, Valium, uh, and there's a whole host of others that can be used on a short-term basis to address overwhelmingly uh, strong sources of anxiety and, and situational anxieties as well. Um, but those medications are often controlled, sometimes more uh, harder to get, and there's other therapeutic interventions that can be used um, than using a benzodiazepine to, to treat anxiety. Uh, there's also therapy as well, cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, dialectic behavioral therapy uh, done by a, a clinician, uh, which can be a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist or, or other therapist. Research shows that when you combine uh, CBT and DBT therapies with a medication, 
uh, the uh, treatment outcomes are, are very, very good. And there's a, a kind of a final line of treatment which folks can use uh, if they're um, being treated for, for depression and medications aren't working, therapy isn't working, different combinations of medications aren't working, other interventions aren't working. Uh, and that's called electroconvulsive therapy where a physician, a psychiatrist, and an anesthesiologist would induce a seizure. Uh, it's, uh, in short term of it, it's kind of like uh, resetting your neurotransmitters. Uh, so you'd have to go to an outpatient clinic or sometimes you can do it inpatient as well. Uh, and it kind of resets all of the, the neurotransmitters. Um, and research shows that uh, it can be very, very effective, especially those who are uh, treatment resistant to depression. Uh, however, some folks think that ECT therapy is kind of barbaric because you're giving someone a seizure, um, but it's, it's well controlled, uh, it's uh, very safe, and again, very, very effective for those who have uh, treatment-resistant depression. So again, that's kind of my short talk on older adults and depression. We talked about the risk factors, we talked about uh, how to be diagnosed, we talked about different treatments, and if you are feeling that you are depressed, you can certainly reach out to the senior center, myself or our social work staff uh, with the Council on Aging. Uh, you can consult with your physician, you can call, consult with area therapists to seek the treatment that you need. Um, my phone number is 781-316-3405, or you can call the front desk at the Council on Aging at 781-316-3400. Uh, my apologies for the sobering talk, but uh, again, depression is quite prevalent uh, among the, the older adult population. Um, so thank you for listening and thanks for watching Living Out Loud.